Welcome to What Now, a video interview series brought to you by Michigan Future, a nonpartisan think tank striving to be a catalyst for recreating a high prosperity Michigan. I'm Sarah Sherpicki, the vice president at Michigan Future and the host of What Now. As the global coronavirus pandemic shut things down this spring, it didn't surprise us at Michigan Future that so many of the issues we've already been concerned about, which I can most succinctly describe by saying that almost half of Michigan's households struggle to pay for basic necessities, were under a new spotlight. The structure of our economy and our job markets have been leaving many people behind, and that was before the pandemic started. What now is our attempt to explore issues that have been exacerbated or highlighted by the pandemic and where we have an opportunity to rethink and redesign how we want our systems to work. Critical to upward economic mobility and being a place where everyone can succeed is increasing educational attainment in Michigan. We need to rethink how our state educates children to be successful in the future and to make sure that we're affording the same opportunities for success to all of our children, not just some. This is why we selected education as the first subject of our What Now series. In today's rapidly changing economy and job market, the most essential skills for young people to possess at their end of their educations are a set of uniquely human skills. When we remake our education system so that we're building confident, collaborative, creative, critical thinkers and lifelong learners, then we will be positioning Michigan and our families for successful futures. Our guest today is someone who's been thinking a lot about how to make that system work better for all children, including the black and brown children who are often afforded the fewest resources and opportunities. With more than 20 years of experience as a K-12 educator, Danielle Jackson is CEO of University Prep Schools, or U Prep Schools, a longstanding charter network with 10 schools in Detroit. She has taught and led at the elementary and middle school levels and previously served as the chief academic officer as well as the principal of U Prep Academy High School for four years. Danielle is a native Detroiter and was educated at Detroit's Wayne State University. She has a master's degree in educational leadership. Danielle and I haven't met before today, but I was really struck with the views she shared in an interview with Authority Magazine, where she shared some of the critical learning that UPREP is doing about how to better support students and about how urgently our whole system needs, as she put it, a facelift. Danielle, welcome, and thank you so much for talking with us today. Thank you for having me, Sarah. So let's talk a little bit about UPREP's history. And I think over the past 20 years, the whole field of education has learned a lot about what leads to success in college, um, which includes sort of this expanded view of the characteristics and mindsets that help kids be successful. And it's not just like a certain score on the ACT or the SAT. So uh, just in its journey and in your personal journey, what have been some of the most important things you think UPREP has learned about preparing kids for college? You know, a couple of things come to mind. I think one is we've always had this really deep commitment to, to really learning who each of our students were. You know, mm -hmm. our mantra in, back in the day was one student at a time. Mm -hmm. And I think that that has evolved into how we describe it today as self-actualization. Mm -hmm. So it's important for our students to know, it's important for us to know who they are. It's it's more important for them to know who they are. Mm -hmm. And so I think what we've learned over time is that um, we can be strong advocates for children and that's our responsibility as educators. We must also ensure that they become strong advocates for themselves. Mm -hmm. I think the other pieces we've learned is that um, we pride ourselves on building strong community. We must also help children understand how to build community for themselves. Mm -hmm. Our students are largely, you know, we're majority, Black students, and they sometimes go to predominantly white institutions. Sure. And so that um, it's like being a fish out of water. And I almost don't even understand, forget about my intelligence. How do I navigate this social arena? Mm -hmm. So even helping um, exposing our students to different social experiences are also important. I think the last piece is we've always, um, you know, our history was embedded in every student having an internship, this idea of authentic learning. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to push beyond, you got to do this because this is what you got to do. It has mm -hmm. to be meaningful for mm -hmm. students and it, they also have to be able to attach that to their future. And mm -hmm. so I think how we've evolved that over time is really understanding um, 
there's a lot of entrepreneurial spirit amongst our students. And so how do we push them to be their own, um, you know, be their own boss, mm -hmm. while at the same time understanding the current marketplace and the type of skills in terms of mindsets mm -hmm. and ability to collaborate along with math, mm -hmm. English, mm -hmm. social studies, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So just really evolving how we um, define what a, what a strong education is. Mm -hmm. Well, it really sounds like all of those things you talked about are really about recognizing the power in the students themselves and, yeah. and sort of helping them like identify it, grow it, you know, be able to own it. Absolutely. Yeah. That's really nice. Yeah. I think that oftentimes when we talk about children of color, we say things like the free and reduced lunch rate, you know, poverty, you know, it's always, how can we save them? Mm -hmm. Where our philosophy is, no, how can we embolden them? Mm -hmm. How can we inspire them to see what we see in them, their, you know, their intellectual potential? Mm -hmm. We start with their barriers, the things that are challenging. Right. Yeah. Right. Which are not the children's fault. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, so as you've thought about this, like making this shift towards really making sure your students are empowered, like what are the strategies? How do you actually do that? Well, I think our most recent and, and uh, something I'm really proud of, um, led by our dean at UPA um, High School, we hung the flags for Black Lives Matter and our rainbow flag for LGBTQ plus. And that was purely driven by student voice. And so we're constantly um, thinking about how we can amplify their views. I remember sitting with lunch at one of our other high schools, UPAD High, with seniors last year before the pandemic hit. And one of the things they talked to me about was, you know, we want to have a structured way to influence not just the rules, mm -hmm. you know, our uniform code, mm -hmm. but like how we function and operate mm -hmm. as an educational entity. Mm -hmm. And so we're on the hunt for um, how we can incorporate. And I think the pandemic has given us an interesting opportunity in that way because mm -hmm. they vote with their Zoom camera, yeah. right? Yeah. And so um, we've really had to dig into what type of project work would inspire them, um, how we start to address issues that matter and that they're, they're, that are facing them socially and in their neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And we have just found that to be a path that we wanna really push for. Mm -hmm. That's, it's interesting. We did an interview just the other day with a retired superintendent who said, we should be researching what's working during the pandemic. Because if kids are learning right now, even though they might be in a remote environment, um, then that's engaging work, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, so I think it's so interesting that you, you know, basically said the same thing. Like we have a real opportunity to learn what they want to do right now. Um, yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah. Um, so when you think about um, sort of the skills, we've talked about this, these mindsets of kind of being empowered and self-advocate and their own self-advocates. What are the skills when you look at like the future job market um, or however you want to define it? that you think it's really important to develop in kids? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we talk about one being problem, um, problem solving. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. We are asking students to solve problems we don't even know we have. Like that's really what the marketplace is doing. We're giving you a solution to a problem that you didn't even know you had until we showed you this solution. Mm -hmm. And so what that requires is for us to release the certainty that education used to be about. I want to get that A, I want to get that B, you know, give me the formula, give me the, you know, give me the, the recipe, I'll follow it and I'll get there. Yeah. Whereas the marketplace is saying, no, we need people to solve problems. We need people to innovate. Mm -hmm. We need people to collaborate. So it's not just me getting to the mountaintop by myself. I need to know how to work within a team in order to make that happen. Mm -hmm. And so also by critical thinking, how can we analyze something, mm -hmm. make meaning of it, which may lead to more research, 
to make more meaning and then ultimately make a decision about what we want to do about it. That turns our whole educational process on its head, which is what led to my facelift comment in the first mm -hmm. place. You know, it's really interesting that the, that the marketplace, corporations are saying, we need children coming out of the school system who can collaborate, who can speak well, who can problem solve, who can critically think. But many of our systems of educating are still reminiscent of the past. That certainty, here's how you get an A. We have to do math the way we've always done math mm -hmm. instead of allowing kids to problem solve in math in the way that makes sense to them as long as we arrive to the place we're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that there's just a lot of, um, you know, opportunities for us to listen to what the market is saying it needs and be transformative mm -hmm. in how we're preparing our students for the jobs of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So how do you, I mean, that's a really big shift. And in some ways, I mean, I don't know where it starts, but certainly the teachers have to, it's like figuring out how do you help teachers, maybe some of whom have been teaching sort of in a traditional model for decades. Mm -hmm. um, what do they need? We know they're working hard and we know they care. What do they need to, to flip the model? Now, this is a really tender um, subject for me. First of all, I want to give a shout out to all of the teachers at UPrep because they are truly amazing. Mm -hmm. um, I think they need permission. Mm -hmm. um, you know, much like I was just saying about certainty, I think we're set up as teachers to operate in the same way. Yeah. There's so much pressure on educators today to get that number. Yeah. That the idea of being creative and innovative with instructional pedagogy is a dangerous place for teachers. Mm -hmm. Because what if I try this and my kids are learning, like clearly I can show you portfolio evidence that they're learning, mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't quite do, get an uptick in one year mm -hmm. on ACT or the MSTEP. Um, there are consequences for that. There are consequences for schools in the newspaper. There are consequences for teachers in their rating as a, you know, as we increasingly, as we increase student performance on their evaluation. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, I believe my responsibility is creating psychological safety mm -hmm. for teachers to take risks mm -hmm. and helping them to understand that it is okay to be masterful and also reinvent yourself mm -hmm. as a teacher, mm -hmm. that those things don't have to be mutually exclusive. A lot of our teachers in this pandemic environment are struggling because they went from like having this strong command to like, now I'm navigating all of these platforms. Mm -hmm. So we've just been doing a lot of work, giving permission, mm -hmm. you know, taking one day at a time and praising the risk. Yeah, yeah raising the risk. Yep. Well, it's, it's like trying to really make sure that every school is also a learning organization, you know, yes. so that your teachers are your experimenters yes. and you can share like what is working and, and sort of grow it. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Um, I know you also, and I want to sort of get into the pandemic moment in a second, mm -hmm. but I know you also mentioned sort of shifting towards like project-based learning um, and just the other pedagogies. Is that something you guys are, are sort of fully taking or maybe were before the pandemic? I don't know if that has maybe changed the priorities, but um, what are the other modes of teaching that, that do uh, help students achieve this kind of learning? You know, project-based learning is very much part of our roots. Mm -hmm. um, I will say along the way, um, we lost sight of it in, ch in you know, chasing rigor. Right. Yeah. Um, which is really cold for certainty. <laughs> you know, you follow this path, you get the score. Right. Yeah, yeah. We are now coming back. The pendulum is swinging back to you no know, project based learning is the birthplace of critical thinking, of innovating, of problem solving. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to just develop any kind of project. We want to develop projects that are impacting our students and their communities right now mm -hmm. so that the in um, the, pro the end of the road uh, performance task, right, is actually something that can be presented to an authentic audience. Mm -hmm. And what we've committed to this year is we're not going to let our pivot to virtual disrupt that 
that passion and that path. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It just requires us to think outside the box. Mm -hmm. And again, creating that safety for teachers to try um, perhaps um, a different path than what they may have done before. And they're not like experts at it, mm -hmm. but we've committed that we're gonna to continue to, to pursue project-based learning as a priority. Mm -hmm. How are your kids doing? What are the needs that you're seeing for them that are um, sort of your highest priorities? Yeah, you know, Zoom fatigue is real. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, pandemic fatigue is real. Um, we, we know that um, there, there are cases where, or they're experiencing, that we have families experiencing where there are multiple children on computers. Mm -hmm life is happening in the background. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're not um, fortunate to be able to zone, you know, even in my house. I mean, we, my son's in college and he's in one room, my husband's on the yeah. phone in another room. So there's this, um, there, the learning environment, mm -hmm. I think is really transformed in this, in, during this pandemic um, season. And we're really having to problem solve around how we teach our kids to be with us mm -hmm. despite what's happening um, mm -hmm. around them. Mm -hmm. And then there's just the realities of what was difficult or challenging for our families are exacerbated in this environment. Mm -hmm. And so making sure that we're um, attaching them to services that are supportive, such as mental health services, and just digging in, you know, what are some ways that we can help and how we can strengthen our connections. So we, the communications, for example, our two-way communications that we're uh, responsible for doing, we devote at least one to doing a wellness check. Mm. Where we're not just talking about what's happening in school, mm -hmm. but we're, we're talking about what's happening in life. And where appropriate, we make modifications. Mm -hmm. You know, there are families whose circumstances just don't allow um, to be 100% compliant with everything that we're asking them to do. So we try to create multiple pathways for them to access what we're, what we're offering right now. So is there anything, and you know, I, the phrase you were using before about giving permission, which I think yeah. is so important, um, in order to focus on the sort of social, emotional and keeping the relationship centered is, or the relationships among the community, is there anything that you've had to say or that you've been able to say, deprioritize this? You know, this, whatever, is something we normally care about. It is the eighth most important thing right now or something, you know? You know, what's interesting when the way that question lands on me, I, it's almost as if we've said without saying it, it's almost like we, we approach this year with a clean slate. Mm -hmm. So rather than taking stuff yeah. off the list, yeah. we made the list. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. Which, which is a lot easier than spending time thinking about what you, you can't do. Mm -hmm. And so we just decided we were going to maintain our, our priorities, our network priorities. We gave ourselves an opportunity to say, okay, what does this look like in this virtual space? Yeah. And now let's construct that. And we are literally like one day at a time, one day at a time, which, you know, we're, we're constantly annual planning, <laughs> you know, it's a perpetual annual plan. And uh, we had to just let that go. Like there, it, like their certainty is gone, yeah. uh, which can, is, is scary, but in many ways it can be a bit freeing. It's been a challenge for me. I'm not going to lie, but yeah. um, I've embraced it because you can't um, you can't expect people to take risks when you want to do what you used to do that is mm -hmm. really not it's just not going to happen in this year. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so if we do kind of take this moment to look at our whole education system kind of under under the spotlight, um, what is what what are the big, I mean, I want to do both sort of gaps and opportunities, but what are the things that this is showing you like our system was not doing? Maybe you already knew it before, but. You know, uh, and, and to, to some degree, yeah, the, the, I, I knew some of this before. Our kids have said in a resounding way, school is not reflective of who I am or what interests me. As soon as they're old enough, which is usually around nine, mm -hmm. 
they start to show you that this really isn't. I think for kids who play the game of school, they know, you know, they know how to play the game of school. They can they can kind of make it through and still good get good grades and and all of that. But I think this has really forced us because again, I'm not going to show up on Zoom unless it's compelling. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I think we knew and I don't think I know we knew um, and we were pressing in on engagement. Uh, we have a five element model. One of the, one of them is engaging instruction. So this idea of authentic learning, project-based learning, we knew we had to get there because that's how you tap into the interests of children. And I mean, young children, this isn't just for high school. Sure. And so I know that we must be transformative in our thinking. The question is, will our accountability measures on the other Mm -hmm. side of the pandemic adjust as well? Because Mm -hmm. that's really like, you have to be a rebel, like, okay, screw it. You know, I'm just gonna throw caution to the wind in order to push um, innovation in education. Yeah. Um, but we all know that accountability is real, um, necessary, and, and I think it is necessary, but we have to think how can we redefine it to give schools the space mm-hmm. to do the meaningful work I believe is more meaningful to children and as a result will provide much stronger, um, much stronger citizens and social activists in the end. Yeah. So if you could sort of um, remove the I want to talk about accountability a little bit. Mm-hmm. Let's pretend that just we'll just put to the side the the idea that like the state has to do this. Yeah. So if accountability was just in your system, what is like the the way you would want to? It doesn't matter what anyone else like thinks and how the state's going to hold you responsible. But, like, what would you want from your teachers to know like? this is okay. You know, (laughs) good thing kids are learning in this classroom. Like how would you do accountability? Yeah. So I, you know, I, this is kind of a tricky, um, this is a tricky question. Yeah. Um, so Sarah, I will say that I think there always has to be standards. Mm -hmm. There are standards in everything that we do. And so I think that there is a place and an appropriateness about having standards because it gives you your target, if you will. Mm -hmm. I think where I would pivot is having a much stronger relationship, not to cancel out um, post-secondary or the college space, but having a much stronger relationship with the marketplace Mm -hmm. where we have folks from different areas of, um, of career paths come in and help us to form what are the experiences, the mindsets, dispositions that students need to come out with so that they're ready to mm-hmm. in, inject into these different organizations, be it nonprofit, the tech space, the STEM space, that they're prepared to link in and inject new energy and innovation into those spaces. I would want to hear more from them so that we can then backwards engineer now, what do our project-based space need to look like? I think that's the way of our future. And I think in some ways, the 21st century skills were kind of designed to start that conversation. Yeah. I would I would definitely deepen it if it was yeah. in my court. Yeah. Yep. And so if you like, okay, I've got a list of skills. Um, are you then looking at like, I want to see authentic work. Like I want to look at student work or performance tasks in order to like, is that you know, where you would go? Yeah. As I mentioned in the article, I think portfolios are, and we, we are definitely a portfolio driven um, set of schools. Mm -hmm. The proof is always in the work. Yeah. So analyzing student work over time, you can clearly see the evolution. Mm -hmm. Again, it's the evolution of student work over time, just to position to a target. Where do we want them to be by end of year? And then how is their work evolving to show that? So I think there's a strong place for performance tasks, which are part of the whole project-based um, learning system. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that most of the skills that we would probably hear from employers tend to also be the skills that do lead to post-secondary success. Exactly. And so that might be more of a knitted together conversation, you know, than, than a divorced conversation. Um, exactly. Yeah. yeah. 
it, it, exactly. I think that for, um, we need to understand as human beings, like when we're going into the post-secondary space, why are we doing it? Like for me, I wanted to be a teacher. So I understood that in order for me to be a teacher, college was part of that process. Mm -hmm. I think it's making that connection because we certainly preached college for so many years at U prep, you know, university prep, you know, you need to go to college. But this inquisition about, well, why? Like, what is the end game goal for me? How is this going to be a differentiator for me? And so I think by having stronger contact in the career space yeah. when they're in high school gives college its meaning. Yeah. So this idea of persisting through college, because I know on the other end of it, I'm going to be able to go into this um, career path that I'm really passionate about. Mm -hmm. I think that was a vacancy in our um, rhetoric that I want to really close. So mm -hmm. to your point, I think there is a grading there. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we just do so much conversation around the college process and going to college that the career pathing is a place that we can explore more. Yeah. You know, the, I, I always struggle with this, um, distinction in some ways, because I know, like, I don't feel like we ask rich kids to really know what they're going to be when they grow up they mm -hmm. just are going to go to college because they're going to and so um and and so it's interesting and i like from reading your of uh, the interview and authority your interest on passion and purpose so i think is is different from how you hear some people talk about knowing the career um as a substitute for passion and purpose like um i don't know if i'm saying this very well but it's like we i hear people talk about kids who don't come from wealthy backgrounds as like we've got to get them on a, a career path as opposed to they're humans we help to help them find their purpose and their own passion so i really saw that as like a, a distinction that you brought in um in the authority article does that make sense does that resonate with you like it does it yeah. does and in and, and having um millennial children and gen z children in my home and in my family they will their journeys will take them to many places yeah, yeah. so this really isn't a you know you go to you know you go to school you go to college you get a job you retire in 35 years that's not their experience mm -hmm. so this idea of connecting to purpose mm -hmm. i think is what helps them to navigate that wind that blows for them yeah. you know that wind of change they're much more willing this generation is much more willing to take those risks and try something different and so having some understanding of like this is my north star Mm -hmm. That North Star might take me in a, in a lot of different directions, but I need to know what that North Star is, which I think is about purpose. Yeah. So mm -hmm. how, how do we change education? You mentioned internships, that those have been important to you, Preps Model, but what else do we do or what are the strategies you're thinking of to, to help kids identify passion and develop sort of passion and purpose, which yeah. I think is also connected to them feeling powerful enough to have one, you know, um, if you don't feel powerful, it's hard to feel like you have a purpose, but yeah. so how, what are the strategies? Yeah. So we have, um, we have definitely stuck our, our stake in the sand around culturally responsive, um, education. Mm -hmm. um, I think that many, um, many of the tenants were floating around the U prep network, um, but we hadn't really defined it in a way that's like, this is the charge on how we're going to make certain our community reflects the children that it serves. And I think you do that in a couple of ways. One, we have a, a strong crew structure, and this is about matching um, a teacher to anywhere between 18 to 25 students that belong to them for a period of time. Mm -hmm. And your role, and we literally talk about crew like you're in the boat, Everybody has an oar. Mm -hmm. You have to know the direction that you're going in or you're going to flip over the boat. <laughs> so this idea, like we're attached to each other's success, but there's also personal responsibility in that. So the crew in the crew structure goes from that one to 25 to a grade level crew to a whole school crew. And there's rituals and traditions that we have in place that is largely designed 
to support that self-actualization process. Mm -hmm. So I see in you progress, be it with your attitude, be it with your schoolwork. And so we're goal setting every week and we're talking about how you're doing. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one um, big piece. The ritual and traditions really matter because that's when you have student led, they're, they're all student led, even in elementary school mm -hmm. um, where each crew, you know, even in the virtual space that's happening. We have crew competitions and things like that happening. So that's one. I think the other piece is that um, that exposure to college and career from K on. Mm -hmm. Again, going back to purpose, like helping you to understand why are you doing what you're doing? Mm -hmm. What what is doing what you're doing going to allow you to get to? Like, what are the what are the different roles that open up to you as a result of that? Um, again, it's project-based learning um, that we've talked about quite a bit, but it's also service. Mm -hmm. You know, how can we give back to the communities that we live in or communities that we select so that this idea of service, it, it's bigger than just me. Mm -hmm. And so I have a responsibility to myself and to others. So while crew does that to an extent internally, service helps to expand that. Mm -hmm. Now that's been a challenge in the pandemic space, but you know, I still think that that's a, um, a really big part of it <clears throat> as well. And then we've talked a lot about um, this week, we're, I think this next week, we're launching the first HBCU um, week mm -hmm. that's sort of nestled into our college process. We haven't talked a lot about that, but the culturally responsive role sort of took us there. Oh. And, and this idea of like, how do you match students to a college that reflects who they are, mm -hmm. but also aligns with their purpose. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes that's going to be an HBCU. Sometimes it's going to be a predominantly white institution. Mm -hmm. Either is okay, mm -hmm. but it's just expanding the, the windshield, if you will, that our students have mm -hmm. about what can be next for them. Mm -hmm. they leave. I think that's also that path planning for students when they leave us having a strong plan that they can go into and transition into. Mm -hmm. And I think the last piece is, and this is, I think has been the most difficult to fund mm -hmm. when they transition out of high school, having a strong support bridge mm -hmm. for at least the first two years of their post-secondary experience. Mm -hmm. um, I have a 19 year old, 19 year olds are very similar to 18 year olds. They still need that home based support. Mm -hmm. And we've expanded our kids' community. Our, you know, we're, we're part of their family network. How can we still be there and support during those first, those early years of like adulting that they're ha it's happening? Mm -hmm. So, um, what, sh what should that support look like? Um, so we we were lucky enough um, a, a while back in our in our history to have this role funded through a grant, mm -hmm. and what it looked like literally was traveling to campuses, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, meeting at the student union, mm -hmm. having a conversation, and that conversation was both an accountability conversation: how's it going with your classwork, getting to class on time, etc. Mm -hmm. But then, how are you doing as a human? Yeah. And what are some things that we might need to, you know, sort of problem solve together that that will help you to persist? It's also when they come back home, getting them together because they were a crew at one point and now they disperse. Mm -hmm. So teaching them Facebook has brought us a long way. But prior to Facebook, you're like bringing back together. You're still part of this network and community. Mm -hmm. So like don't lose touch because that's what helps you get through the hard part. Mm -hmm. And it and it's also been. I'm not, I'm stopping out of college. Mm. There, for one reason or another, I have to stop. Mm -hmm. What do I do next? Mm. So part of that conversation has also been, how do you navigate what may be the reasons why you're stopping in a way that maybe you can start again at some point yeah. and not see it as a total I have to abandon the idea of college. That was also a big part of it too. Yeah. Um, so uh, as you, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about kind of the social emotional skills and the, 
development of humans as opposed to just the a sort of traditional teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. is, is there anything else that you do with teachers that's about helping that stuff all be more integrated mm -hmm. um, as opposed to sort of like, we do social emotional learning in one hour, you know, and, and ELA in the second hour. So how do you help teachers sort of all um, take on that imperative of um, human need, you know? Yeah, you know, this this is another one of those um, heart, heart questions. <laughs> yeah. What's required of us, if we are expecting the little humans to do this deep work of self-actualization, mm -hmm. then the big humans have to do it too. Mm -hmm. And so I know that our teachers are on at different phases of that journey. Mm -hmm. You know, we have some teachers who dive right in, like, I want to talk about my story and they, and they're just really confident in it. And then we have teachers who are like, I, I, I am here to teach, you know, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, that's not my thing. Mm -hmm. And it's very uncomfortable because it just conjures up a lot of stuff. Um, that as human beings, because we're human beings first, maybe we haven't just haven't had a chance to navigate or maybe our life experience hasn't given us the language to talk about it. Mm -hmm. So we are um, working, we, we're working to develop all, all parts of our teachers mm -hmm. and, and leaning into vulnerability, mm -hmm. our own bias. Mm -hmm. You know, that's an, another thing that we talk about, like what is the bias that you're bringing to work as a human and how, how is that influencing you one way or the other in your pedagogical practices and having those real intimate, difficult conversations. And I just think that there's no other path to get there. Yeah. And so create, again, going back to creating psychological safety, mm -hmm. um, it's important that we, um, we convey to our teachers, particularly who are younger in that, in that journey, that vulnerability will not be used against you. Yeah. You know, when you tell your story, um, it, you, it, you won't get slapped back in the face. That requires a level of discipline on all of our parts because that, that can be a little touchy, mm -hmm. um, but it's the work. Yeah. It's the work. And they don't teach you that in education um, mm -hmm. programs. <laughs> um, yeah, which that could be a whole other um, interview series is teacher training for yes. this new day, this new day. But um, how how could our system, mm -hmm. um, the whole the whole system, better sort of support or make it easier for educators to focus on those like sort of human skills and capacities as opposed to math, you know, this particular math standard or. or yeah, there's a saying what measured what's measured gets done. Yeah. yeah. And so the day that um, we decide that um, that social emotional learning is as important mm -hmm. as any other type of learning, um, that social emotional well-being is as important for a teacher educator as their understanding of pedagogy. Mm -hmm. Once we make that decision, then we'll do it. Um, it, it won't feel so revolutionary because it'll be expected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so what else, is there anything we haven't talked about that, that gets to sort of how do we use the pandemic as an opportunity to rethink like what our education system needs and actually maybe what's possible within it as mm -hmm. more than just what it needs? You know, I'll just... <laughs> I'll just say that um, I, we decided early on in our March to June shutdown, we started, we, we decided early on, we were going to use this as an opportunity. We didn't, um, we were very careful to, to ride the tension. We lost a kindergartner um, to this pandemic. We lost a number of parents. Mm -hmm. um, our school teams have lost relatives. And so it touched us early on. Um, so we were we were very sensitive to this is happening and it is horrible for families and individuals who are impacted. And at the same time, we're going to use this as an opportunity to be transformative in the work that we're gonna do for kids. Mm -hmm. And both of those things can be true. Mm -hmm. okay. And so in making that decision, I understand and my leaders understand we're in this really unique place of like anything goes. 
and it, we don't know how long it's going to last. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> So we better take full advantage of it mm -hmm. because when the dust settles and the new normal is like no more masks, no more, you know, when that part is over, we would have been able to, um, our hope and optimism is that we will have gotten further along, uh, further along enough in our redesign of how we operationalize education. Mm -hmm that is showing promise mm -hmm. in the traditional ways of measuring student success. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, th I think part of what I hear you saying is also that, um, that you can gain some clarity in a crisis about what, what is the most important stuff. Um, and it is still a crisis, it doesn't make it not a crisis, but that, right. that clarity can come, yeah. Um, if you make the space for it. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Right. Um, so what, what are, what other like critical things are happening or what are you thinking about a lot right now that if, that we haven't talked about? I often say, um, as a reminder, the crisis will end and people will forget. Mm. And those communities hit hardest by it will be vulnerable to that lapse of memory. Yeah. And so that worries me. Um, it, it worries me because I don't hear the signals of our um, state government redefining how we measure success yet. Mm -hmm. I hear them pausing. Mm -hmm. I hear them saying, we're going to do what we've always done, but how we're going to use it is going to be different. Mm -hmm. I don't hear transformation. I don't hear innovation. That worries me. Well, Danielle, thank you. It's been such a pleasure to talk with you. And um, I hope our paths sort of cross again in Detroit. Yes, for sure. Thank you for having me again. It's been a pleasure. Join us in episode four, when we'll be talking with Dr. Sarah Fine, the director of the San Diego Teacher Residency at High Tech High Graduate School of Education. We're trying to create classrooms at High Tech High more and more, I think, where kids are not just engaged in interesting intellectual work, but they're also engage in regular opportunities to critique the world around them and then and then act on those critiques as well. We'd love to hear from you about how to make Michigan's education system work better for all kids. Please find us on social media.